Hey there, welcome to my channel. I hope you're all doing well. In this video, I'll be covering hypertension. This video will have all the information that can be beneficial to patients, students, and current practitioners. So I hope you learn a thing or two. The definition of hypertension is in the word itself. Let's break it down to hyper and tension. When something is hyper, it's over, beyond, above, exceeding. Tension in this case is referencing blood vessels, the pipes that blood flows through. So the tension of the blood or force or pressure against the vessel walls. Hypertension is when there is a chronic increase in this tension or force or pressure against the vessel walls. This is why hypertension can also be referred to as having high blood pressure. Let's learn more about blood pressure and the changes in the body that can cause it to increase. So normally blood flows through the vessels to different parts of the bodies. The main function is to transport oxygen and nutrients. Blood contains red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets that also have their own functions. So that is what this picture is showing here. Here is another image of what I just discussed. Don't make it complicated. Just think of it as water flowing through a pipe. In order to determine the pressure of this water flowing through the pipe, we have to look at two things, the systolic and the diastolic pressure. The systolic pressure is the pressure in the arteries when your heart contracts and pumps blood out. The diastolic pressure is the pressure in the arteries in between contractions. So after contraction, when the heart relaxes and blood enters the ventricles, the pressure within the ventricles is the diastolic pressure. Here's a picture to help you visualize this. According to the American Heart Association, normal blood pressure is less than 120 over 80. The blood pressure is influenced by the cardiac output and the systemic vascular resistance. The cardiac output refers to the amount of blood that the heart pushes out during a contraction. The more blood is forced out, or if cardiac output increases, the more filled the blood vessels or pipe will be. This will increase the pressure inside. If the cardiac output is low, the blood pressure will be low as well. The force or resistance that the heart must overcome to push blood through your body is the systemic vascular resistance, labeled here as SVR. Sometimes it's referred to as the total peripheral resistance. And of course, the higher the resistance, the higher the blood pressure would be. The lower the resistance, the lower the blood pressure inside the vessel will be. In normal circumstances, your blood pressure should be less than 120 over 80. But in general, patients with hypertension have a systolic and or diastolic over 130 and or over 80, respectively. And this is accompanied by a chronic increase in the cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. And this chronic increase in the cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance is able to overcome the body's mechanisms or processes that normally helps maintain your blood pressure and keep it balanced. I will discuss the common ones next. In response to acute changes in blood pressure, the body responds through the barrel receptors located within blood vessels. Baroreceptors are responsible for short-term blood pressure regulation. Baroreceptors are a type of mechanoreceptors that become activated by the stretching of the vessel. So there are baroreceptors that respond to low blood pressure and baroreceptors that respond to high blood pressure. When activated, the receptors communicate with the central nervous system to correct the changes in the blood pressure. This is known as the baroreceptor reflex. Next thing that helps regulate the blood pressure is anti antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin. It's responsible for intermediate blood pressure regulation. That means it doesn't fix the blood pressure instantly when it's out of range like we see with the baroreceptor reflex. Instead, it takes time. Anyways, it is synthesized and released by the hypothalamus due to certain triggers, such as increase in the osmolarity and reduction in the blood volume. When someone is dehydrated, the osmolarity or concentration of things in the blood will increase. Antidiuretic hormone will then be released to increase water reabsorption in the kidneys. This will result in increase in the intravascular volume and the cardiac output subsequently. Finally, we have the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which is also an essential component of blood pressure regulation. 
long term. When this system is triggered, it takes long for us to see the effect because it involves gene transcription to produce certain proteins and then we get the effect. I have a video on ACE inhibitors and ARBs that thoroughly discuss the mechanism of the RAS system. Check it out if you need better understanding because in this video I will not discuss it in detail link above. This system kicks in when there is a reduction in blood flow to the kidneys, which can be due to a decreased cardiac outputs or blood pressure. In response to this, the kidneys will release renin, which will convert a protein called angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 will subsequently be converted by angiotensinogen converting enzyme ACE into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor which will help regulate the blood pressure. In addition to this, angiotensin 2 stimulates the release of aldosterone from the adrenal gland which results in a further rise in blood pressure due to sodium and water retention. Now, if the body has all these mechanisms in place to keep the blood pressure balanced, then what really causes the mechanisms to break down for us to say that someone has hypertension? In most cases of hypertension, we do not actually know what caused it. This is known as primary hypertension or essential and idiopathic hypertension. It occurs in about 90% of all hypertension cases, and although there are no identifiable causes of this, there are certain risk factors that can predispose a patient. So people who are obese, have a high sodium intake, diabetic, heavy drinkers, elderly patients, or having a family history of hypertension. Secondary hypertension is caused by another condition. This accounts for 10% of all hypertension diagnosis. Some of the diseases responsible for secondary hypertension are renal parenchymal diseases. The parenchymal refers to the cells in the kidneys that carry out essential functions. Here I have the kidney and on top of it I have the adrenal gland. Some of the renal parenchymal diseases that can cause hypertension are diabetic nephropathy, glomerulonephritis, polycystic kidney disease, renal vascular disorders where there is a blockage of the renal arteries. Certain conditions of the adrenal gland can also leads to hypertension. That's that thing on top of the kidneys in this picture. Conditions like Cushing's syndrome, where your body's making a lot of the stress hormone cortisol. Primary aldosteronism, when the body makes too much of the hormone aldosterone, which the function is to retain sodium and water. And lastly, adrenal tumors can also be a cause of secondary hypertension. Hyperthyroidism is another one. Obstructive sleep apnea and certain medications may also contribute to the ideology of secondary hypertension. Now, regardless of which type of hypertension it is, the diagnosis is pretty similar. Here we have a patient, John, who is visiting his doctor for his annual routine checkup. We will call this his first visit. His blood pressure reading today is 135 over 83. According to the American Heart Association, the diagnosis should not be made on a single office visit. So usually two to three office visits at one to four week intervals are required to confirm diagnosis of hypertension. Let's just say he came in for another visit two weeks later. This time his blood pressure reading was 138 over 79. So technically, according to the American Heart Association guidelines, this patient has hypertension. But the guidelines also state that if possible and available, the diagnosis of hypertension should be confirmed by a out of office blood pressure. So let's just say that John checks his blood pressure the following day at home and it's 129 over 82. Now we have a more accurate diagnosis of hypertension and we know for sure that the patient's elevated blood pressure during the doctor visit was not due to the phenomena called white coat hypertension where the patient has an elevated blood pressure when they go in for their doctor visits. It also rules out masked hypertension where the patient has non-elevated blood pressure in the doctor office but elevated blood pressure out of the office. So it's a combination of both settings when it comes to diagnosing hypertension. And once this is done, treatment should begin ASAP. Research has demonstrated a reduction in the incidence of some of the complications associated with elevated blood pressure. So treatment reduces the risk of stroke by 35 to 40%. For myocardial infarction, a reduction of 20 to 25% and heart failure by 50%. Patients with high blood pressure fall in three main classifications and this also impacts how we manage them. We have the patients with a high normal blood pressure. 
In these patients, blood pressure readings consistently range from 120 to 129 systolic and less than 80 diastolic. People with high normal blood pressure are likely to develop hypertension unless steps are taken to control the condition. Next is hypertension stage 1. When blood pressure readings consistently ranges from 130 to 139 systolic or 80 to 89 diastolic. At this stage of hypertension, doctors are likely to prescribe lifestyle changes and may consider adding and blood pressure medications based on the patient's risk of developing a heart attack or a stroke. Lastly, hypertension stage 2, when the systolic blood pressure is 140 or higher or diastolic is 90 or higher. At this stage of high blood pressure, doctors are likely to prescribe a combination of blood pressure medications and lifestyle changes. Now we could discuss each classification in detail. For patients with high normal blood pressure, no drug therapy is recommended. Instead, it's just lifestyle modifications then we reassess in about six months. So first, weight loss. For every one kilogram reduction in body weight, expect about a one point reduction of the blood pressure readings. Next, consume a diet that is rich in whole grains, fruits, vegetables, and reducing food that are high in saturated fats and total fat. Next, salt reduction. There is a strong evidence supporting the relationship between high salt intake and increased blood pressure. Optimal goal is less than 1500 milligrams per day of sodium. Next, potassium has been shown to be effective in lowering blood pressure, especially in patients consuming excess sodium and in African American patients. Guidelines prefer potassium rich diets over supplementing with pills. Some good sources of potassium include fruits, vegetables, as well as low fat dairy products certain fishes, meats, and nuts. Next, regular physical activity may be beneficial for both the prevention and treatment of hypertension, so cardio and resistant exercises. Lastly, there is a positive association between alcohol consumption, blood pressure, the prevalence of hypertension, and cardiovascular disease risk. So reducing alcohol intake is beneficial. In patients with stage 1 hypertension, guidelines recommend lifestyle modifications for all patients, plus or minus drug therapy, depending on their atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease, or their 10-year risk of developing one. Meaning, if the patient has a baseline MI, stroke, angina, or peripheral artery disease, or their 10-year risk of developing one, when we use the calculator is greater than 10. If the answer to this question is no, then no drug therapy is recommended. Just lifestyle modification and reassessment three to six months later. And of course, if the answer is yes here, then the management is drug therapy with lifestyle modifications. Blood pressure go in this case should be less than 130 over 80. For patients with stage 2 hypertension with a systolic of 140 or higher or a diastolic of 90 or higher, the recommendation is lifestyle modifications plus drug therapy. And again, we are targeting a blood pressure goal of less than 130 over 80. Selecting an appropriate drug therapy for these patients can be challenging, but I'm here to simplify it. For adults with stage 1 hypertension, it is reasonable to start them off with a single antihypertensive medication and then the dose should be titrated up and other agents may be added to achieve the target blood pressure. Adults with stage 2 hypertension with a blood pressure more than 20 over 10 above their target initiate antihypertension drug therapy with two first-line agents from different classes. First-line agents include thiazide diuretics, calcium channel blockers, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, and angiotensin receptor blockers. Keep in mind that although these may be first-line recommendations, it does doesn't mean that you give these agents to all patients, especially patients with certain comorbidities. So comorbidities like diabetes, chronic kidney disease, stroke, or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Now, the prevalence of hypertension among adults with diabetes is approximately 80%. The coexistence of hypertension and diabetes significantly increases the risk of developing cardiovascular disease. In patients with diabetes and hypertension, all the first-line agents are useful and effective. ACE inhibitors and ARBs are the classes with the best evidence in patients with diabetes and hypertension with albumin urea. Hypertension may occur as a result of kidney disease, yet the presence of hypertension may also accelerate further kidney injury. 
An ACE inhibitor is the preferred drug for treatment of hypertension in CKD if albuminuria is present. If albuminuria is not present, then any of the first-line recommendations can be used. For adults who experience a stroke or a transient ischemic attack, secondary preventative treatment with a thiazide diuretic ACE inhibitor or ARB or combination treatment consisting of a thiazide diuretic plus ACE inhibitor is useful. Lastly, medications with indications for heart failure that may be used as first-line therapy to treat high blood pressure includes all of these. If there is an inadequate response with the first agent with optimal dosing and adherence has been verified, initiate therapy with a drug from a different class while continuing the initial therapy. I have dedicated videos on some of the drugs used for hypertension. I will include the links above in case you want to learn in depth about ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, and calcium channel blockers. I hope this video helped you understand hypertension a little bit more than before. You can show your support by hitting the like button, subscribing to the channel, and also feel free to leave questions and comments below. Follow me on these social media platforms. Thank you for watching this video and take care.